Broadcasting from the Business Radio X studios, here is your R3 Continuum playbook. Brought to you by Workplace MVP sponsor, R3 Continuum, a global leader in workplace behavioral health, crisis, and security solutions. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this special live episode of the R3 Continuum Playbook. My name is Shane McNally, Digital Marketing Lead with R3 Continuum. And on today's episode, we'll be talking with R3 Continuum Medical Director, Dr. George Vergolius, about the recent mass shooting that occurred in Buffalo, New York. We'll also be discussing the impact and trauma uh, that this event caused throughout the the country, uh, what employers can do to mitigate potential violence in the workplace, what employers can do to support their employees and community after a traumatic event like this takes place, and more. Dr. Vergolius oversees and leads the R3 Continuum's clinical risk, threat of violence, and workplace violence programs and has directly assessed over over 1,000 cases related to threat of violence or self-harm, sexual assault, stalking, and communicated threats. He brings over 20 years of experience as a forensic psychologist and certified threat manager to help leaders, organizations, employees, and communities heal heal and thrive before, during, and after a disruption. Dr. Vergolius, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Uh, it's certainly not my pleasure to talk about what we're going to talk about, but um, I'm certainly, uh, it's, it's nice to be able to leverage my expertise in a way that hopefully will be helpful. Absolutely. And so I think with that, we just kind of jump right into it. And can you, can you kind of give us a brief uh, talk through of the Buffalo shooting, the style of violence and um, what occurred? Yes, certainly. And and I will preface this with a disclaimer and say that um, now what's interesting in this case is that we're, we're a week out and we know a lot and we know a lot because one, the assailant um, Peyton Gendron has been apprehended. He had a 180 or so page manifesto. Um, he was posting online. Um, this is an assailant that really... He was secretive in terms of the general public, but in select audiences, he really wanted his voice to be heard. Um, And eventually at the end of a gun, he wanted to be heard, his message. Um, So we know a lot about him. And sometimes we don't know a lot about the assailants this soon after. So we can say, we we can make some assumptions and we can say some things that are um, informed at this point. Um, So what happened is on May 14th, um, uh, just about a week ago, um, Peyton Gerndren, an 18-year-old um, white male from Conkling, New York, walked into a Topps grocery store um, roughly about 200 miles from where he lived, um, and he opened fire. He actually began firing in the parking lot, and he proceeded then to walk into the grocery store and continued uh, shooting people. Um, it's clear from the evidence that it, this was a racially motivated um, attack. Um, I, I, I'm comfortable saying it was a hate crime, although to say that affirmatively is a legal process, um, but he's being brought up certainly on charges of, of it being a hate crime. Um, so um, he. what's interesting here is there's evidence that going all the way back to late 2021, he was already planning this attack. He was going on uh, websites like 4chan and more recently on Discord and um, not only um, engaging in rhetoric that kind of met his ideological view of the great replacement uh, or the, the major replacement uh, theory of the white race being slowly wiped out, which is one of a number of theories that white nationalists and white nationalism um, subscribes to in believing that whites in general are um, – are being somehow edged out or weeded out of the uh, the population, uh, not just in the U.S., but globally. So he was doing this online. He was engaging in online threats. He was engaging in planning. He, for a number of months, was selling off belongings so he can have the money to buy tactical gear and weapons um, and ammunition and so on. On March 8th, he went to, he drove uh, the 200 or so miles to the Topps grocery store. Um, and he basically cased the joint. He walked through up and down the aisles. He walked in and out a number of times. Eventually he was confronted um, by a, uh, by a security guard that had basically said to him, I've seen you go in and out a few times. What are you doing? Um, 
And basically, Peyton said that uh, he was collecting consensus or rather census data, um, which, you know, could have been reasonable. Right. And it was taken at face value. And then he went home and later that night he uh, chatted and he basically said it was a close call. He almost got caught. What he was doing, it was he's looking at the patterns of people coming in and out. He was looking at the areas of the store um, that were busier. And at what time of the day, he was no doubt looking at the security uh, people and their movements, as well as looking at um, how they might respond. Um, um, this is all very planned, uh, pre, what we call pre-attack planned behavior. Um, and it is a pattern that we see a lot with predatory individuals. What he also did is he came in with several firearms in his person, certainly in his car. He was um, suited up in tactical armor, uh, including a tactical helmet. At one point, um, uh, what they call army style or or um, assault style tactical gear. Um, several weapons he had, a Mossberg 500 shotgun. He had a hunting rifle that was given to him by his father when he was 16. And he had recently bought a Bushmaster XM uh, 15 rifle in January from a local gun distributor. That weapon was purchased legally. Um, And in between December 8th and January 19th, he actually visited uh, roughly about 15 different gun stores um, in the greater, larger northern New York area, New York state area. Um, He hid those weapons in his bedroom uh, and he wrote online that he was worried that his parents would find him and he would get found out and his plans would fall apart. That didn't happen. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Uh, When he came on site and started shooting, uh, there was a security guard, an ex-law enforcement officer named Aaron Salter, who returned fire, uh, shot uh, uh, Peyton Genron, uh, but due to the tactical armor he had on, he wasn't able to subdue him or or bring him down. Um, Peyton returned fire, and uh, killed Mr. Salter. Um, I could go on about the details, but then he proceeded to work his way through. His plan, at least as written online, um, was to then go to other locations that day and continue his killing spree. Um, Fortunately, uh, police responded very quickly. Um, I believe at one point he turned the gun on himself. He didn't fire, but he kind of pointed it at his own neck. And the law enforcement officers talked him out of self-harm and they took him into custody. So there's a lot of details I didn't cover. I wanted to give a little more flavor. Um, And what I was highlighting with those facts are things that are very pertinent to the kind of violence that we're seeing here. Um, would Would it be good for me to describe that now, Shane? I know you had several aspects to your question. Yeah, I, if you if you would like, I think you know one question that we could go off of right now that sure. you, you just popped up from what you were saying is when he was going in and out of that store. I, now, correct me if I'm wrong. He was actually full on planning and mapping out everything that he was going to do. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. So one thing that we see with this type of violence, um, and there's two types. Well, before I go into that, because that's an explanation, but to answer your question, absolutely, this wasn't a random, hey, let me just go check out this grocery store. He drove 200 miles in early March to specifically case um, and do surveillance on this store, um, partly to solidify it um, as a target. Um, Sometimes psychologically, we call this a hardening of targets. Another way we describe hardening of targets is if you are if you are a target and you put certain um, security measures in place that toughens them or hardens them after 9-11, even going as far back as after the Oklahoma City bombing by McVeigh. Many federal buildings put large cement pylons in front so you couldn't get a truck right up to the door. That is a security hardening of target. But there's a psychological principle where you also do something that I refer to as a hardening of the targets. You are no longer thinking of the targets as humans, as subjects with lives and goals and dreams and loved ones. You're hardening them in your mind. You're objectifying them. And when you walk through a site as as an attacker and you're committed to the plan at this stage, 
you're starting to just think of this almost like a cognitive exercise. You're not thinking of these people as people. You're thinking of them just as objects, as targets. And so that's part of the process of casing. It is partly, how do I get away with it? How do I inflict maximum damage? But it's also that process of, in your head, kind of stealing yourself, not you know, steel as in the metal, steel, uh, you're hardening yourself and hardening your mind psychologically to commit the act. Wow. Yeah, that's it's just crazy to think that somebody could do that and even go so far as to, like you said, you know, harden themselves to 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 do that in the planning. Well, um, let me ahead. just piggyback on that real quick. What's interesting is assailants that are in this predatory mode, and I'll talk about that just next, but um they will go to other lengths. Like if you look at um, um, Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris, Eric Harris, this, these are the Columbine assailants. In the weeks leading up to the Columbine attack, Eric Harris specifically went off his antidepressant medication for two reasons. He didn't want to feel emotionally subdued or mellowed. He wanted to feel the full rage that he was feeling as he went into that attack. He wanted the full... Um, you, you almost can say it. He wanted to be emotionally amped, right? He wanted to be jacked up emotionally. He purposely did it. That wasn't accidental. When you see these guys, and they're almost all guys, by the way, I think I think last data that I looked at from a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, something like three or 4% of mass shootings have been committed by women. Um, so this is almost predominantly a male game right now. Um, um, and people will say, why do they get all this tactical armor? Well, one is maybe self-protection, but let's be honest. In most of these attacks, I mean, if you look at the synagogue attack from two years ago, if you look at the Christchurch uh, mosque attack from a few years back, none of these people had weapons. Um, why do they wear black? Why do they wear camouflage in the middle of the day? That doesn't obscure you. That doesn't hide you. It makes you stand out. They are psychologically gearing up. They're psychologically putting on the uniform to be a commando, to be a soldier of their cause. That's another aspect of them psychologically getting geared up and almost building up momentum to go out. The closest normative example for any of us that ever played football and you're in the locker room, you got your pads on, you got your helmet on and you're smashing helmets with your, you know, your buddy mm -hmm. and you're smashing their shoulder pads. What are you doing? You're getting amped up for the game before you go out of the locker room and take the field. That's fairly normative, right? We all see that. We all understand that these tackers have similar individual rituals that they do to amp themselves up in preparation to go out out of the field of play, as they say it. Um, so yeah, so it, these are really good questions, but yeah, that's what we see. Um, it's a very interesting psychological phenomenon. Wow, and I know I know you mentioned you want to talk a little bit about the the kind of act of violence mm -hmm. that this really looked into, but kind of maybe wrap it in with this. You know, my next question of like, does this shooting remind you of other events in history? Yeah, it absolutely does. So before I go there, though, let me talk about effective versus predatory violence. And then I'll talk about the reminders um, or what it reminds me of. And then the linkages between them, if that's useful. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. That sounds great. Um, so a little bit of history lesson here, but psychological history lesson that hopefully is interesting. We know now that there are basically two biological or biophysiological modes of violence in the brain. Um they have different anatomical aspects of the brain that are in operation. They have different neurotransmitters. They operate um, with different neuronal pathways. Um, and the way this was found out is about 70 years ago or so. Um, I believe it was um, German or Austrian scientists were doing research on cats. And they opened their brains while they were obviously alive. And in case we have cat lovers out there, um, once you anesthetize the skull, the brain doesn't have sensors, pain sensors. Um, and they would put electrodes on the brain. And what they found out, and then they exposed them to different environment stimuli to see how they reacted. And they weren't necessarily trying to study violence per se, but what they found out is that there were two kind of violent reactions that had two different patterns in the brain. One they deemed affective violence or emotional violence, and the other they called predatory violence. Sometimes it's also referred to as targeted. I don't like that term. Uh, I like predatory because it, it kind of shows you the mode. 
Effective violence is violence that most of us have seen, or if we're ever going to be a victim of violence, most of us are going to be a victim of affective, reactive violence. It's emotional. It has to do with hyper arousal, meaning you're jacked up, you're excited, you're scared, you're fearful, you're shamed, you're annoyed, you're rageful, but there's an emotion going on. It tends to be reactive and immediate. It tends to be in response to a perceived threat. Somebody is threatening you or you feel threatened and you need, you feel you need to react back at them. It is a fight or flight reaction. I need to fight the, uh, the threat away or I need to run away or better yet, I need to posture in order to drive the threat away. How is posturing? Well, a quick example of effective posturing. We've all seen this. Certainly boys have all seen this. Growing up in grade school, two kids get in a fight at recess what often happens is they're cracking their knuckles, right? They're puffing their chest. They're, they're, they're swaying side to side. They're putting their chin out um, and they're taunting the other person to hit them. Come on, hit me, man. No, you hit me. No, you hit me. No, you hit me. Do you want to fight? Let's go. And this may go on for minutes before a fight even breaks out. And sometimes the fight doesn't even break out. Looking at those two, the untrained eye would say, oh, well, those two kids really want to fight. And the truth is, no, they don't. They don't want to fight. What they want is they want the other person to walk away and they save face. They save kind of ego. If you look at prison attacks and you could you know, plug the Discovery Channel or A&E and watch prison documentaries, you will see true predatory attacks. There's no warning. There's no posturing. There's no verbal threats. Two inmates are sitting there looking like they're best friends. And the next thing you know, one inmate explosively just starts attacking the other with no warning. Um, it's a very, and it's almost unemotional. It's almost cognitive in the way it's done. So effective on the one side, um, it's also time limited, meaning if you think of a fight or flight reaction, our bodies can't stay in that mode for very long. Um, adrenaline is pumping to your major muscles. Um, you have cortisol pumping, you have different things going on that is all designed to get away from an attack or subdue an attacker. And this has evolution, evolutionary value, right? If, if, if you needed 10 minutes to figure out how to get away from a lion, you didn't live, right? It was an immediate reaction. You had to mobilize to deal with that. Let's, uh, so it's time limited. Um, let's, I'm going to add one more thing that's kind of interesting with mm -hmm. affective violence you will have a displacement of the target. Now, what does that mean? That means that if I'm in an effectively violent mode, right, and someone attacks me, um, I'm going to attack anyone that comes into my circle. So imagine, for example, that I have a cat tied to a corner of a room on maybe a six-foot leash, and I slowly walk a Rottweiler or a Doberman pincher up to that cat. What's that cat going to be doing, right? Obviously, hissing. Its back's arched, its claws are extended, it's showing its teeth. Even if that cat is looking at the dog, would any of us be willing to walk over and pick the cat up? And the answer should be no, right? Why? Because that, that cat's attacking anything that comes into its circle, anything that comes into its sphere. One of the reasons that police officers, their most dangerous uh, response in the field is domestic violence, not just because the abuser is in an amped up state which is almost not always, but usually a man, but often the victim is in an, is, is in a violent state because she is defending herself. She is in a fight or flight arousal herself. And so the whole environment is supercharged with emotion. Uh, and with that emotion comes fight or flight reactivity. Okay. That's effective violence, bar fights, fights at the Thanksgiving table. Hopefully we don't have many of those, but some of us have seen that right. Um, tailgate fights, um, uh, you know, fights at school, all that kind of thing. That's usually effective violence. Um, now let's juxtapose that with predatory. Predatory violence is you have minimal arousal. First, let me give you an example. Let's take that cat and now put that cat two days later in the backyard. And there's a bird feeder, maybe 30 feet away. And a bird lands on that bird feeder. And now the cat sees the bird. Now the cat isn't on top of the bird yet. The cat's 30 feet away. Now what's the cat doing? It's super focused, right? It's, it's staring at the cat. It's got a laser focus to its eyes. Um, its claws are pulled back because it's not ready to attack. 
It wants to move very stealthily, very quietly. And only at the last minute, when it gets close, might it then attack and get aggressive. But it's in a very cognitive focused mode. The human correlate of that is an army sniper. Um, I remember seeing an interview of a sniper from the Serbian um, Croatian war, um, obviously a number of years ago. And this sniper every night would crawl and he was, he was sniping across what they called sniper alley. It was a division line of literally roughly about one street that divided the forces. And he would crawl up a ruble strewn um, staircase and he would have to crawl across the room with rocks and rubble on it and get into position. And then he would look throughout the night for people, frankly, to snipe. And they asked him, when you get to the top of that staircase, how long does it take you to crawl into position that 20 feet or so? And people would say an hour, two hours. It took him often five to six hours to crawl 20 feet. That's how, that's how careful and slow and methodical he was. Think of that, though, for a minute. Think how cognitive you have to be to do that. There's no emotion. There's no reactivity, right? That is an example. Your army sniper is a more... Um, socially sanctioned example of predatory attacks. Um, so when we see shooters like Peyton Gendron and everything I opened the podcast with and all his behaviors, this is a predatory attack, right? Mm-hmm. Minimal arousal, meaning he's not emotional. He's not jacked up at the time. It doesn't mean that he's not yelling things. There's a certain bravado that they will show, but he's not really feeling fear, anger, rage, panic. Um, It's purposeful and planned violent. There's no imminent perceived threat. What we mean by that is nobody in the Topps grocery store posed an existential threat to Peyton Gendron. Nobody did. Now, in his mind, they did because they were, they represented a minority, a black community that was taking over uh, the the white population um, by the proliferation of birth rates and all that, if you read his manifesto. Um, But but they didn't actually uh, pose a threat to him. Um, There was also no displacement of the target. And what we mean by that is, if, if you ever look at closed cam footage of these shooters, And there's a little bit of this circulating with the Pulse nightclub shooting with Omar Mateen. You could see a little bit of this online with the Columbine shooters. You will notice that they're not frantic as they walk through and shoot people. They're very cold and methodical and calculated. Um, Often, I talked about rituals, right, um, of effective violence. You puff your chest up because the signal is, you, you know, if you, it's you and me, Shane, right? It's Shane, you don't want any piece of me. I'm going to puff my chest. I'm going to crack my knuckles. I'm going to sway back and forth. I'm going to look tough. I'm going to look like peacock, right? I'm going to extend my physical prowess because I want you to walk away. I don't really want to fight you, but I can't admit that because I'm a man. So I need you to walk away. The problem is you're doing the same thing. And often one of us crosses a line and it gets physical. In the predatory style, you don't see the public displays because it would give up your intention, right? If every mass shooter showed massive public displays of their intent, we would catch all of these guys. What they tend to do is they tend to show these displays and very focused communities or groups that they think mirror their ideology. That's why he went on 4chan. That's why he went on Discord. That's why moments or hours before he went on the shooting, he invited a very select group of 15 people that were still investigating um, to visit him on the Discord channel and look at his postings. And even, I think there were even links to the live feed that he showed when he went and committed the shooting. So all of these are private rituals. And the goal is to fuel their own narcissism and reduce their paranoia and kind of gear them up psychologically for the attack. Um, and Columbine, uh, 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 Harris and Klebold, they made basement tapes for weeks and months ahead of time where they talked about the attacks and their intentions and what they hoped to uh, get out of it and what their outcome, uh, their intended outcome was going to be. So why do, I go, why do I go into all this? It's really important to understand these features so you can understand what kind of violence Are you trying to um, prevent? I can't tell you after this shooting and after every shooting, how many, and we're going to hear this over the next few weeks, 
people that knew Peyton Gerndren come out and say, oh, I never saw this coming. He was such a quiet, mild-mannered kid. Now, he had some problems, no doubt, but I never saw him get all, you know, erratic. I never saw him explode in rage. I never saw him show high levels of emotion. Well, of course you did. He's a predatory attacker. It's a very different kind of MO than what we would see if you're a psychopath and you're going out to the bars every night and getting in bar fights. It's a very different kind of psychology that goes behind this. I know that was long-winded, but I wanted to do that. Uh, I wanted to do that question justice. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. And I think that leads into the next one really well when you just mentioned kind of the psychology of it. But, you know, there's a lot of talk. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of media, and we'll get into that in a second, around this um, this this shooting and everything. But there's also a lot of talk about the attacker himself and being evaluated by mental health professionals, you know, the year prior to the, the attack. So there's this like idea out there that uh, you know, mental health treatment can or should play a role in preventing these types of attacks. And events like this, obviously, like, you know, the idea is that they show a crack in the system. Can you kind of like expand and, and speak a little bit more on that? Yeah, I can. So we we don't know everything about that. What we know is roughly about a year, maybe a year and a half. I don't have the exact time frame. Um, he was, I believe he wrote a paper or he wrote something down where he talked about or he made statements about committing a murder suicide at school. The school did what they needed to do. They flagged it and they sent him for a mental health evaluation. I don't know where that occurred. Um, I actually work locally here in North Carolina in hospitals um, and I do these evaluations. Typically when the school flags it, they're like, we think this kid might be dangerous to themselves or others. They send him into the emergency department. They're evaluated. And at that moment, it's important to know that the evaluating clinician, typically a doctor, could be a social worker, but typically it's a doctor of psychology or a, a psychiatrist, they have to adhere to an imminent risk standard, which means are you imminently at risk of killing yourself or others? Not are you kind of a bad person or might you do something a week from now, a month from now, a year from now? But are you so dangerous in the next 24 to 48 to 72 hours that I need to take away your rights? and commit you to the hospital. That's There's, there's a few avenues to, to make that happen, but that's the ultimate, is I'm literally going to commit you against your will. In order for that statute, that bar to be met in most jurisdictions across the country, there has to be a lot of data that shows that you're thinking of hurting yourself, you have strong ideation of doing it, you have a, a plan, you have intent and you lack certain impulse control to hold yourself back, and you lack certain protective factors. That's a lot of check boxes. What happened as best we know, from what I can gather from second party sources, is that he went in. Again, by the way, most of these guys are fairly manipulative. Um, Peyton was bright. He actually, I think, won first prize in middle school at a chemistry um, contest. I think he was on the honor roll, honor roll for most of his high school career until he dropped out. This was not a stupid kid. He went in basically and said, oh, I was just trying to get out of school. I was bored, and I knew that would get me out of school. And the other checkboxes just weren't there, and they released him. And that was a year ago, right? You can't lock a kid up for a year. Um, so well, you can in some cases, but you have to be very severely mentally ill, which he wasn't. So I think there's this misconception that a mental health evaluation is going to solve all these problems. There was a really wonderful op-ed piece by Mark Fullman, F-O-L-L-M-A-N, who's written for the New York Times. He's written for Mother Jones. And most of his writing as a journalist has focused in the last five or so years on understanding mass shooting and mass attacks. And he's worked with a lot of very well-known researchers on threat assessment and forensic psychologists. I've seen him talk. I've met him at conferences. Um, really great journalist. He just published an op-ed piece. I believe it was in the New York Times or the Washington Post. I can't remember immediately off the top of my head. I've been digesting so much information on this. <laughs> but he talks about how these individuals do have mental health issues, no doubt. But this is not a mental health problem at its core. The overwhelming majority of mental health uh, or people with mental illness are not violent. Mental illness doesn't otherwise take a nonviolent person and suddenly make them violent. There are rare, and I mean very rare exceptions, where you might have somebody with severe mental illness, 
paranoid delusions, psychosis, where they believe people are after them and they feel they need to defend themselves. There's almost no cases in which those individuals go on a shooting spree. There's a few, there's a few. I think it represents something like three to 4% of all mass shooting seem to be um, motivated by the nature of the psychotic paranoid delusions that the person was having. The overwhelming majority of these cases, these people, they didn't have a great sense of right and wrong, meaning their morality was a little bit skewed like a psychopath's is. But they knew right and wrong. They knew what they were doing, and they were making decisions to do these based on an ideology that they were subscribing to. So that's that's one of the factors I think it's important to realize is that mental health, we do need to improve our mental health system, no doubt. And I think we need to rethink some of the laws we have in order to try to keep people safe. But a lot of these shootings would not necessarily be prevented simply because somebody was hospitalized against their will. And in this case, that was well over a year ago. That probably wouldn't have had a massive impact here. Yeah, that's a, those are some excellent points to bring up around that. So I appreciate you taking, mm-hmm. taking that question sure. there too. Um, and so, like I mentioned at the beginning of that question of going back to it a little bit here, you did mention earlier that, you know, there's, there's a, there was a massive amount of media presence around this shooting and understandably so with news outlets and everything like that. And, you know, can you tell us about the impact that having so much media presence has with, you know, this level of violence? Yeah, absolutely. So there's this thing in the field that we call um, the contagion effect. There's also the copycat effect. The copycat effect is simply, and actually we saw this, and I'm actually going to dovetail this with an answer to a question you asked earlier that I got away from, where you asked simply, um, does the sh- does this shooting remind me of other things? And it absolutely does. Um, and just in recent memory, right? So um, we know, for example, um, on, I think it was, it was October 27, 2018 in Pittsburgh, the tree of life synagogue, Robert Gregory Bowers, 46 year old male went in and shot 11 people, um, in the synagogue. Uh, and he, it, his, his thing was very similar to the whole white replacement theory. Uh, and he was blaming Jewish people for being responsible for the, being the immigrant invaders and being responsible for promulgating the immigrant invaders. Um, we all have heard of March 2019, the Christchurch, New Zealand shooting. 51 people shot by Brenton Harrison Tarrant, 28-year-old um, white male from Australia. And he clearly um, was responding in a very similar way to what he perceived was the great replacement. He actually called his manifesto the great replacement. And it was the same ideation Um that uh, that Peyton Gendron was was re- replying to. In fact, um, in August of 2019, Patrick Wood Crucius at the Walmart shooting in El Paso uh, mm-hmm. shot 20 people. Same thing. His manifesto he called the inconvenient truth, but it was the same thing he was railing against: is that this attack is the responsible for Hispanics in this case invading Texas, and he felt like people needed to come after. Um, or he needed to go after that contingent of society to defend the white race. Um, so there's clearly a plan here. And what's interesting is Patrick Crucius, the shooting at the Walmart, he got his inspiration from um, Harrison Tarrant uh, of the Christchurch shooting. And we know there's indications from the manifesto that Peyton Gundren also got his influence or motivation or inspiration from prior shootings as well. So what we see is there's a certain copycat effect of people see earlier shootings where people have similar or closely aligned idea, idea, um, uh, ideologies, and they use that to fuel their own ideation, and they almost see it as their hero, and they further uh, commit an act. What we also know, that that's the copycat effect. What we also know is there's something called the contagion effect. And what we've known, and now we've known this for 30 years, and that is when there is a mass televised or massly publicized shooting of a mass shooting or a widely publicized um, story of a mass shooting, there is a significant increase. Usually it's been measured at 10 to 13 uh, 
X increase of another unrelated mass attack occurring within about two weeks of that publicized event. Now, that used to be regional. If you go back 30 years ago, basically, if you go back before social media and, and mobile phones, it used to be, you know, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Shane, I know you're in uh, Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. If there was widely publicized in the newspaper, there would be a certain geographic barrier to the publication of that where that risk would increase. Now that we are truly a globalized news kind of uh, feeder source, that regional uh, barrier just doesn't exist. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, you could have a shooting in New Zealand. And it's covered all over the news globally, and it's on CNN and Fox News every night, and it motivates some guy in um, Albuquerque, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But what's behind this psychologically? In a weird way, it's a really understandable dynamic, aside from the heinous system of the violence. What's behind it is someone sitting at home right now, as we're talking, and they're got a lot of hate, a lot of anger, whatever their ideology is. It could be right wing, which a lot of it right now is right wing. It could be left wing, right? Um, it could be uh, Islam, you know, radical, violent Islamist. A lot of ab- directions, but they're thinking somebody should do something. Somebody should do something. And then they watch a shooting like this. And maybe they start saying in their head, God, this Peyton guy was kind of a loser. If he could carry this out, certainly I can, Right. I could pull this off if he can. Why won't I? Maybe I should step up and take arms for the cause. Fill in the blank of whatever the cause is, right? Because mm-hmm. it, it could be on different levels of the political spectrum. Um, and then it bo- emboldens them to start. It's almost like the light bulb goes off and it emboldens them to move forward with a plan. The other thing is there's people that have already been incubating in that for months or years. And what they needed in a way, psychologically, is that model, that, that, that last inspirational push over the edge to move into planning or to take things to the next level and go into planning mode. Um, now, when I said earlier, this is normative psychologically, you're, you're like, what? Well, here's my explanation. And I'm going to give you my personal story. Almost every year, I sit down, sometimes with my wife, she'll watch it. Other, other times she doesn't. But almost every year when the Iron Man right? The Kona Iron Man is on TV. I watch it from beginning to end. And I, you know, I love watching the athletes that finish in X number of hours, but I also love watching the people that are doing it all day long and they make it in, you know, with five minutes to go before they shut the race down. Right. And there's also that one guy, I forget his name, whose um, son is cerebral palsy and he finishes the whole race every year or used to, I don't know how old he is now, but mm-hmm. it's very inspirational. And he does it with his son. He like, pulls the sun on a, on a, on a, on a small raft. And then he rides the sun on the bike. And then he pushes the sun on a stroller through the marathon. And it's the most inspirational thing in the world. And what do I do in the next morning? I wake up early and I go and buy groceries and I buy spinach and I buy protein drinks and I buy all kinds of stuff. And for about two days I work out and then I go back to eating nachos. Right. <laughs> but for a short period of time, I'm looking at these images and saying, damn, I can do that. I should do that. It's the same psychological principle with the contagion effect. We're just seeing it directed in a really heinous, violent, violent avenue. So, yes, these these events do have precursors and they do piggyback off one another uh, in the mindset of certain numbers of assailants. But let me say one more thing, because it's important to know. Positive interactions could have the opposite effect as well. Um. I remember listening to a um, famous um, um, security expert threat manager, Joel, Joel DeVoskin. He was doing a postmortem autopsy, a psychological autopsy, as we call it, on the Columbine assailants. And Eric Harris was set. He, he applied to the Marines. And about three weeks before the shooting, he got his rejection letter. And he got rejected. I think he had an ear or a foot issue. I don't remember the exact issue, but there was some issue medically. And they just said, we we can't accept you. And somebody asked him, if Eric Harris would have gotten into the Marines, do you think he would have backed away from the shooting? And Joel DeVoskin said, and I agree with him, absolutely. Absolutely. That gave him something to look forward to. That was his whole life. 
It gave him motivation towards something better and more pro-social. There's no way he would have gone through that shooting. And I actually, I'm inclined to agree. So what's interesting is there are people on this trajectory that haven't committed yet, but are inching towards committing and something positive happens. They find a girlfriend. They get that job that they didn't think they'd get. An old mentor calls them. I mean, a million little things. And it just turns them off a trajectory. And it's just enough to nudge them off the pathway. Now, some some could get nudged back on the pathway. But sometimes it's just enough to nudge them off the pathway. So there's, there's some really interesting dynamics that play as people are navigating through this process of trying to decide, do I take this to the next step um, and continue on that path? Wow. Yeah. It's, and you know, we, we've like, like, like you said, we've seen this everywhere in the news and, and everything like that. And additionally, this one was a little, I think different because it was also live streamed. Um, He had a, a live stream up as well. And I think kind of going into you know, how this can actually impact uh, people that were that were there, but also people across the country that have seen some of these videos or, you know, are, are just upset and, and traumatized, honestly, about the whole thing. And understandably so. How how did live streaming this online really have an effect on people that may have seen it? Um, you know, is it likely to increase fear and, and trauma to people that weren't there but did see this shooting play out? Yeah, I, I think there's a few ways in which it could significantly impact people. Um, by no means am I going to say it, it's going to cause trauma. That's prescriptive and different people react differently, right, sure. um, to that. Um, what I will say is for those people that have been subjected to violence, those people that have been involved in a shooting, lived through a shooting, have had loved ones involved in a shooting – it almost brings, it can, I should say, bring back the experience very viscerally. So there's that subgroup. That's a pretty small, that's still a pretty small subgroup of the population. But even those people that may not been subjected to it, but saw it, it's disturbing. These are disturbing things. I have been allowed, given my background as a threat manager and a forensic psychologist, I have had aspects or, as, uh, I'm sorry, um, access to seeing aspects of closed cam footage shooting or even direct shooter footage when they had a body cam or they had a GoPro. Um, And it's disturbing. These are disturbing things to see without a doubt. So there's certainly, there's the risk of it being traumatizing. There's a flip side to it. And that is for those individuals that are on a trajectory and maybe just a little more upstream from where Peyton is in the, or Peyton was at the process, it could also be emboldening, emboldening to them. Right. It could be an image for them of um, almost reinforcing their own sense of belief of going through something like this. Fortunately, and this is where social media has come a long way. This thing was taken down, I think, within minutes. Right. Mm, And scrubbed, which is good. Um, But, yeah, I mean, these these are these are traumatic things. You know, I think if I recall right, the first. There actually were other captured shootings that occurred. There was a shooting from the late 80s where there was a a gentleman whose son had been molested. And the the molester had um, fled the state and was being uh, was brought being extradited back into the state, flown in to a certain airport. I forget the name off the top of my head here. And the assailant was at a payphone. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you know, you're nodding. I can yep, see you nodding I, yep, your head. I know exactly what you're talking about. And he he just said, "Why? Why did you do this to my son?" And opened fire. That was on TV, right? Ruby shooting um, Lee Harvey Oswald was on TV. The difference here is that was passively captured. The first time I think we saw it by the assailant, to my knowledge, was um, I think it was Vester Flanagan, the Virginia news uh, 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 anchor uh, who shot a cameraman and he shot a female anchor because he lost his job at um, OWN something or other in Virginia. I, again, usually I know these off the top of my head. Um, and he scre- he live streamed and, and, and videotaped um, approaching them during a, an external video shoot. And he shot the cameraman and he shot the female um, anchor. Um we saw this a few other times. Um, I fear that we're going to continue to see this a little more often. It is 
if you get out of the moral aspect of this, and this is one, this is part of a podcast that where if someone takes this next statement out of context, I'm going to look like a monster. So I'll, I'll, I'll preface it. If you get out of the moral overlay, right. And you approach this from a perspective of, boy, how do you really want your message to be heard? How do you want to get out your message to the world? If you really think you're a soldier of X cause, X, Y, Z cause, boy, taking a gun and strapping a camera to you and shooting a bunch of people in service of a cause, being a martyr, being a soldier of the cause, great way to get your message out, right? In other words, that's the problem is it can have real important, important meaning, not important, um, visceral impact from the perspective of getting your voice out. Now, it's a voice of hate. It's a voice of violence. It's not a voice I think anyone in a pro-social democratic society wants to support, um, but it is a way to get your voice out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like you mentioned, I mean, this can impact people all over the place. And I think that it's important to kind of take it into, you know, into like the workplace context. So say, you know, if, if you're an employer and you have employees that have seen this or, you know, maybe, you know, they're just this hate crime is really, you know, they're scared now to go kind of out and about. They weren't they weren't there. They weren't at this tops. You know, they just feel, uh, you know, they weren't directly impacted, but they do feel, um, you know, some major emotional connection to this. What what should employers be doing to to kind of help out their employees after this? So there's a few things that I would keep in mind. One is be careful not to prescribe trauma. In other words, just because people are upset doesn't mean they're traumatized, right? There's an old saying that every time you said you couldn't go on, you did, right? What's interesting about the research on trauma is the overwhelming majority of people that have been traumatized don't actually experience ongoing traumatic symptoms. In other words, they absorb it. I call it, they absorb the punch. One is, is how I describe it psychologically. It may take a few weeks, but think they settle back into their life. They, 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 They pull up their natural resilience. They pull up their loved ones, their friends, their hobbies, their coworkers, their faith-based groups, whatever it is. And they basically just kind of get back to their life. Doesn't mean it didn't impact them. Some walk away with a deep sense of meaning as a result of what they went through, but they kind of get back. There's other people that for any number of reasons and no judgment, and it's not a sign of weakness, they can't quite get over it and they might need treatment. They might need medications. They might need therapy. All good. We want to get them that if we if we can. Um, so as employers, I think it's really important to not necessarily assume, oh, everyone's fine or assume everyone's totally traumatized. It's important to have resources for that whole gamut and allow people to tap into their natural resources and their natural resilience. So that's the first step. Um, the other thing is to be mindful of these are high impact events but they're extremely low risk in terms of statistical likelihood, right? So they're low frequency, high impact, no doubt, right? Most of us, many of us have been involved in very bad, severe weather, maybe even some of us in a tornado, but every time it rains or thunders, we don't immediately freak out about our tornado occurring, right? So it's important to educate ourselves on the likelihood of any one of us being involved in a mass shooting as a victim is really, really, really low. What you can do though, is be mindful of where you are, have awareness to this day. Well, it's funny after Sandy hook, one of the biggest fights my wife and I ever had, but she agreed with me to her benefit. (laughs) So I'll give her, I'll give her props. (laughs) My kids must've been, boy, they must've been like seven and nine maybe even six and eight. And after Sandy Hook, I sat them down and I had a talk with them about mass shooting. I explained how predators think in these attacks. I explained how they look for a, for a, for a, um, a kill zone. I explained run, hide, fight. I literally explained if you have to run away, run away, holding your book bag in front of you, reverse it on your chest and now all people, some people are going to be laughing at this. None of that's going to stop an AR-15. But, no, but and, and my wife was mad at first until I convinced her, we're either going to have a hard discussion now 
by the way, I'm also a forensic psychologist. I'm also a child psychologist. I kind of know how to have these discussions. I'm not saying this is for every parent and I'm not saying everyone has a tolerance for this. So I'm not prescribing it. Right. (laughs) But I said, we're either going to have this hard discussion now or, and it's a low risk, a very low risk, but we might have to have a hard discussion over a funeral casket. And I'm not having that discussion. And if I do have that discussion, I'm going to have it knowing I tried everything I can to educate my kids on resilience and under and being aware. Mm-hmm. Really interesting. Fast forward two years, my daughter had a school shooting, a, a significant scare. Turned out it was a false claim, but they locked everything down. And there was allegedly somebody on site that might have had a gun. Um, what was interesting is they were barricaded in her room. And it's hard to visualize on a podcast, but imagine that there's the door to the classroom. And as soon as you open the door, she was directly in line of that doorway. And there was a kid in the totally adjacent corner that got up to go get his book bag. Now, whether you agree with my daughter's morality, you know, you could, you could debate. But when he did that, she knew based on what I taught her, that as soon as that gunman comes in, he's likely to start firing and he's likely to spray to one side or the other. And usually they spray and they pull out and they go to the next room because that's what they're doing. They're moving on. They're moving on. Almost like an urban assault. You clear a room, you move on. You clear a room, you move on. Um, And I know that in large classrooms, when like Columbine, and this this is tough to talk about, but um, it's rare that Everyone in the classroom is shot unless the assailants come back and they look for victims to pick off. I won't go way down into that detail, but she knew all this. So when that kid got up, she scurried across the room and she took his spot, knowing that she was in a better position based on what I taught her. Now, I'm not saying anyone listening to this go out and teach their kids this. What I'm saying, though, is as employers, decide what do you want to impart to your employees just about physical security awareness, awareness of your space, right? If somebody does come in with a gun, where are you going to hide? What can you use as a barricade? If it does come down to a last ditch effort, what can you use as a weapon to fight, right? Understand the concepts of run, hide, fight, and understand that it's not a sequence, you don't always have the luxury of going from running to hiding to fighting. There's, there's moments where it's like you turn a corner and it's like, damn, there's a gunman and he's two feet from me, right? If you psychologically try to at least, at least to some degree, get in the mental space for this, you're going to be just a little more prepared than somebody that is completely um, ignorant of, of understanding these concepts. Now, I'm not saying all employers just start a dialogue. I really believe it's important to get experts that know how to do this. And, and whether, whether they coach you on having that dialogue, whether they do the dialogue with you, or maybe they do the dialogue themselves as the experts, it's important to have dialogues and discussions around these things so that people are um, forewarned with information. And that way they can be somewhat forearmed to be ready if and when these things start to occur. That's a great point. And I, I want to ask too, you know, as a follow-up, you know, whether you are an employer or a leader in a, you know, corporate setting where you're going into the office every day, or you manage, you know, uh, like ex- for example, a grocery store, is it equally important for both sides to to teach their employees and, and provide resources to be proactive and understand that ahead of time? I think, I think it is. I think what we see from the data, and unfortunately we've got a lot of it is from an industry perspective or a location perspective, these are equal opportunity attacks. We see them in manufacturing plants. We see them in churches. We see them in grade schools. We see them in daycares. We see them in grocery stores. Um, We see them in a number of different types of environments. And whether it is an unassociated attacker right? Um, Gendron was not associated with tops. He picked it. It was a racial profiling is what he did. And he chose it for that reason, just like the mosque attack uh, in New Zealand, just like the Walmart attack, or it's an ex-employee that's disgruntled. And that isn't associated. That's a person, more a personal attack. The, the company aggrieved me in some way. Even if you feel like, well, I'm, we're super low risk. We're not a minority group, right? When groups aren't going to attack us, Right. 
okay, you know, you're some, you know, white church in the South, right? I'm, I'm being cliche here on purpose. Um, yeah, I, I, my guess is maybe white nationalist groups may not want to target you, right? If we're using the right wing extremism, jihadist groups might. Um, the point is, you can always have that disgruntled ex parishioner, that disgruntled ex worker, that um, for a number of reasons decides at some point that they need to be heard and they're going to be heard at the end of a gun. So I think, yes, to your point, all employers need to be thinking, um, not panicking. Again, I want to, I want to, I want to give voice of caution and voice of um, cool heads here. Um, but at least being forewarned and forearmed with information is really important in this day and age. Yeah. And you mentioned too, you know, that experts are able to help out. Can you kind of just give a little bit of a, some insight into like what, what you mean by experts or what resources people should be uh, utilizing? So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk specifically, I'm a certified threat manager. I'm a forensic psychologist. So I have consulted with companies where I have trained the trainer, where I have trained HR or managers to have these discussions or to train their people on situational awareness. Other times I've co-presented with them and other times we've just come in as experts and we've done the training ourselves. There's other times we've um, um, facilitated roundtables where people might get a training and then they could come in for several weeks and just have open discussion about their worries or concerns or even scenarios, right? Just have an open dialogue about these things. There's different ways that you can manage this in different organizations. Many organizations have their own security departments and they might have their own trained people that, uh, that understand threat management and threat assessment, and they don't need outside experts. Um, but a lot of them don't have that, right? A lot of employers don't have that access. And so they do need that available, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and by so the way, Shane, let me just add real quick. Mm -hmm. I also do this at the individual level, right? This doesn't have to be at the employer level. Um, to this day, every time my kids hate it, to this day, every time I go to a movie theater, and before the lights go down and before the um, the, the uh, preview start, I will say to them, all right, where are the exits? If a guy comes in from, and I, again, I always say a guy because it tends to always be, if a guy comes in from here, where are you going? If a guy comes in from there, where are you going? And it's to the point that as soon as I start the sentence, yeah, dad, we know if a guy comes in from the left, we're going over this seat and we're going down to the exit down there. We're going to keep a low profile and we're going to duck behind the, you know, and it's almost a game now. But again, it's ingrained in their head now. It's ingrained in their head. And I just try to do that at the individual level as well. I, I will also say I can attest to that. Uh, since working at R3, I have actually started to do that same thing. And I am not, you know, a certified threat manager or anything like that. But just kind of hearing that, those stories and, and ways to do that, I will literally like, especially going to a movie theater or things like that, I, I do the exact same thing. So yep. that's, yeah, it's, it's come to me too. Um, <laughs> so Looking at like, we, you know, we've talked about kind of preparing and before, before, uh, you know, how you can help mitigate this as an employer, looking at after the fact, you know, how, if, if an event occurs, so say, say a crazy, you know, say this shooting happens at your organization, what resources or what should leaders be doing to help this recovery process after the fact? Two things off the top of my head that come to mind. One is. I think it's important to give them access to counseling support resources. Now, what I mean by counseling is not necessarily formal therapy, right? Some people may need that, right? But if you remember what I said earlier, the majority of people adjust to trauma. They, they're affected for a few weeks, but then they kind of get their life back, right? They adjust, just like we adjust to grief, a loss of a loved one. Most of us, we absorb the blow and we get our life back slowly. We still are impacted, but we get our life back at a really relatively functional level. Make resources available. One of the best resources is disruptive event management consulting and counseling, where professionals, clinical professionals come in and they help people, totally voluntary for the individuals receiving it, but they help them process, talk through, make sense of, digest, if you will, the events and the impact on them. A subset of those people, of those recipients, of those employees, they might need referral for more ongoing therapy. Nothing wrong there. That happens. But a lot of them, that initial impact 
or the impact of that intervention, I should say, can be very, very powerful. And you usually want to impact that within 24 to 48 hours. You don't want to wait 10 days, two weeks, because what happens is what we know, even from a traumatic angle of the impact on the brain and your body, things start seeping in and you start developing fear patterns and thought patterns, usually already within six hours after an event. Mm. You could short circuit those and reverse them if you have certain types of interventions within 12, 24, 36 hours. You start going further out, there's a risk that we start developing maladaptive habits and patterns. So that's why that kind of intervention, you want it very quickly. And you the goal is to build up their resilience, right? So that's one level. The other level and part of that service should also be, um, should also be uh, management consulting. How does management handle the messaging, right? If certain people are killed, do you share that openly in a message? Do you not share that? Do you give bereavement time to everybody to attend funerals? Do you not? We literally have had questions where there's blood at the work site. Do you clean it up before people come back and give and, and risk people feeling like you're whitewashing over the event? Or do you leave it and risk re-traumatizing people when they come back? These are delicate questions. And, and the, oh, these are delicate questions. Sorry about that, guys. It was a Tornado warning of all things we were joking about <laughs> on my on my phone. Um, um, and these are delicate questions that managers have to think about. And they have no experience, right? Because very rarely have you been through this before. Right. Most employ most employment locations happens one time. If if well, not most. Most it never happens to. If it happens to any of them the overwhelming majority of them have not had these large scale traumatic events occur at all. So managers, it's new to them. Whereas folks like us, like, like our three folks, like threat managers, like myself, this is what we do. This is the kind of crisis management, threat management work that we do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we've gone through, you know, we've discussed the the shooting in Buffalo. We've kind of gone through what employers and organizations should be doing beforehand and, and following that event and what resources are available out there. So thank you for uh, Dr. Virgolis for going, you know, from, from A to B on that. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, if you have, if you, the guests would like to hear more from you or to get a hold of you or anything like that, uh, how would they be able to do that? So two, two, probably the two best ways is my email at R3 is George.Vergolius, V as in Victor, E-R-G-O-L-I-A-S as in Sam, at R, the number three, the letter C as in Charlie.com. Or you can go to LinkedIn. Um, and I won't give you my whole uh, actual address. If you type in George Vergolius, I'm the only one that pops up. Fortunately, I have a very uncommon name. So you should be able, um, I'm medical director at R3 um, and you should see me pretty readily. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for being with us today, Dr. Vergolius. Um, and thank Absolutely. you everybody for listening. R3 Continuum offers a plethora of services that can help organizations with disruptive event management, violence mitigation, uh, disruption response and recovery, threats of violence, and behavioral health solutions that can help ensure the psychological and physical well-being of organizations and their employees. We make tomorrow better than today by helping people thrive. Connect with us and learn about our services at www.r3c.com or email us directly at info at r3c.com.